Amen. In John, the beginning of the Gospel of John, John says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then before the cross, Jesus is talking to His disciples in the upper room, and He says, If I go to prepare a place for you, will I not come again to get you? And there where I am, you will be also. And before he's arrested, he looks at his disciples and he says, And when the Son of Man comes again in glory with his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Because we've been through this season that we were in in Revelation and Daniel, and we've seen that God is telling an amazing story. A story of his creation, our rebellion, his redemption, and ultimately the future restoration of all things. And we live in this space between the redemption and the restoration. Between His first advent that, that, set, that was the redemption and His second advent, His second coming, that will be the final restoration of all things. So we're going to start this series today that we're calling Prepare for Arrival. And we're going to filter all that we see in the Christmas story through what we know in His overarching story in the story of His final restoration. Guys, the story of Christmas is a story of peace, but not just peace on that night that He came and, and you have the picture in the movies of this peacefulness in the stable, although I can't imagine how peaceful it might have been. Childbirth, if you've witnessed it, is generally not a peaceful thing. But it is a story about a God who moved heaven and earth to make peace. He moved heaven and earth to make peace. Peace has to be made. We had to be, had to, he had to make peace with us. And that's why the story of the creation, fall, redemption, and restoration is such an amazing story. Because it's a story about a peacemaking God. It's a story about a pursuit, a God who just pursues us relentlessly. Guys, he created us for relationship with him. Whether you know Him or not today, sitting here, you were created for relationship. Remember that as we talk today in this message about, about how we tend to fill the void of that relationship. Because what we do is we shove Him away again and again and again. Even after we come to Christ, we often shove Him away in little ways throughout our life again and again and again. But here's the thing. He doesn't turn His back on us. When we shove him away, he turns to us. Isn't that an amazing thing? He doesn't just reject us when we reject him. He pursues us. He doesn't demand something of us. He doesn't say, well, because you've rejected me, I'm demanding this of you. He actually does. He did it. He doesn't expect that. He doesn't wait for us to do anything. He did it. And that's what we're here to celebrate during this season. Someday he will come again to finish the work he started at the redemption, and that was what his first coming was. So today's message is about a, is, is, as we prepare for arrival, a prepared people are peacemaking. Why? Because he's made peace with us by pursuing us. He pursued peace to make peace. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what in the what is wrong with the world? Like you look around and you go, what's wrong with the world? Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it was at Thanksgiving dinner with your extended family. And you're like, man, what is wrong with the world? Like really? Right? Here's what's wrong with the world. We are running around pursuing peace in ways that are not of Him. Guys, th think, think about how we pursue peace. And this is in and out of the church. Think about how we pursue peace. The two areas where we tend to have struggles in peace is pain, physical, emotional pain, and conflict, relational conflict, right? How do we tend to pursue peace in those things? When I'm physically in pain, what do we tend to do? Medicate, right? I'm fighting through this head cold all week long. I'm a big fan of medication. I'm not anti-medication. I am I'm a walking pharmaceutical right now, right? I am also a walking essential oil. I've got thieves oil and peppermint and things I don't even know what they're called in me right now. I am an equal opportunity medicator. However, I am also a prayer, and I've asked people to pray for me through just, just being able to come up and share a message this morning. 
Right, so, so do we, is our first flinch to medicate? Guys, guys, think about this. Most substance abuse issues are people medicating themselves from emotional pain. Guys, pornography is self-medication of, pain, of the pain of, of past hurt. So when we experience pain in the world, we tend to try to find our peace in other places. And that's true in conflict too. All right, when we experience relational conflict, what do we tend to do? We tend to run away. If, we're, if we feel like we're in conflict with God, we tend to deny Him and deny His existence. When we're in we're conflict with each other, we tend to separate and get away and run from each other. But guys, was there conflict in the garden? Yeah. God created them. He was walking with them. They decide to reject his will for their lives, reject his word, and immediately there's conflict. And yet he pursues them. Who, he, they didn't come to him. He came to them. And that's, the, that's this story over and over and over again. A people who reject God and he keeps pursuing relationship. And because that's how he responds to us, that's how we should respond in relationship to one another. Guys, conflict is not something, and when I say conflict, I, I don't mean confrontational. I'm not talking about fighting and anger. There's, that's the enemy. I'm talking about like relational tension conflict. Guys, conflict is not something to be avoided. It's something to be leaned into because it's what God is doing in our lives to make us look more like Christ. Guys, was there conflict at the cross? Yeah, but does Jesus, did Jesus rise again and then go, look at what you people did to me. I'm done with you. No, he's still calling people to himself today and we're going to see that firsthand. Guys, we, we went through 2 Timothy and we saw Paul, the Apostle Paul, who's like, you know, the, probably the, the, most, the strongest figure that none of us can relate to in all of Scripture because he's like, he, he just gave his life to the gospel. And at the end of his life, at the last letter he writes that we went through in 2 Timothy, guys, the list of people that rejected him was much longer than the list of people that were still with him. He found himself alone, chained to a floor in a prison. And yet, he considered it, he considered everything he lost as gain. For the surpassing knowledge of knowing Him. Right? Our problem is that we pursue peace in unhealthy ways. So what's the solution? What are we going to do? Well, the answer is, as believers in Christ, we have to seek peace differently. And that's what we're going to look at today. So today's question is, what does it cost to make peace? What does it cost to make peace? And we're going to look at Isaiah 26. So Isaiah, if you open up your Bibles to the middle, they might, it probably will fall open to either Psalms and Proverbs, and Isaiah is to the right of Psalms and Proverbs. So you're going to get past Psalms, Proverbs, Song, Song of Psalms. You're going to get to Isaiah 26. If you get to Jeremiah, which is another big book, you've gone too far. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are after, so come back to Isaiah chapter 26. Guys, if you need a Bible, as Jeff mentioned, raise your hand. We'd love to put, put one in your hand. If you don't know your way around your Bible, don't be ashamed of that. You know how the best way to know your way around the Bible is just get in the Bible. Spend time at, you know, be in, a, be in a Bible teaching church where they use the Word of God in, bo in both on Sundays and in studies and just start working your way through how to find your way around. But don't, I remember as a young believer kind of like feeling embarrassed. Like, I don't really know where that book is and I don't want the person next to me. Because that's not who we are. None of us have got this figured out. So if you don't know where to find Isaiah, just look at the person next to you and go, hey, help me find Isaiah, would you? And then you know where Isaiah is. Isaiah 26 and we're going to look at three ways that four verses in Isaiah 26 tell us the cost of peace in our lives. The first thing that we have to do is we have to stay persistent. We have to stay persistent to pay the price for peace. Look at the first two verses. He says this in, in Isaiah 26, 1 and 2. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city he sets up walls and ramparts for security. Open the gates that, that the righteous nation may enter. The one that remains faithful. On that day. Guys, th th think about in, if you were here, and I know many of you were not, but if you were here for the Revelation study, does that not, does that not beckon back to Revelation 21? In that day, you will enter the gates, those who remain faithful. In Revelation 21... 
It says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from, from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. This is the coming of the new earth. This is what Isaiah is speaking to. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these words down, for they are faithful and true. And then he, Jesus, said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And he who overcomes will inherit these things. Back here, before I finish it, look at back in, in verse 2, the end of verse 2, and the one that remains faithful will enter. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Guys, the peace of God can only come from peace with God, and that peace with God can only come through Jesus Christ. That's what is clear in Scripture. If you don't know that truth, I would love to talk to you about that truth today, as would probably anybody sitting next to you that knows that truth. If you don't know the truth of the reconciling peace of God through the cross and why that matters, come talk to me. Because for the first 25 or so of my 50 years, I didn't know it. I wasn't raised a Christian. I don't believe this because my parents taught me this. I believe this because he revealed it to my heart. And I would love that to happen to you today. So come talk to me. Talk to somebody today. But guys, think about this. When Jesus was getting ready to, to go to the cross, he says in Matthew 25, he says, be on the alert because you don't know the hour or day of my return, of my second advent. What hour and day is he talking about? Well, in, back in, in Matthew 24, he says that nation will rise up against nation and there will be earthquakes and there will be famine and people will turn against each other and you will be brought before the courts and, and all these things that as we saw in Revelation are happening in our world today, right? That's the day that this occurs. And you say, well, wait a second, where's the peace in that? Guys, the peace in that is, is in the Advent story. It's in knowing that the same God who worked everything together, as we're going to see in this coming month, as we celebrate his first Advent, the same God who worked all those pieces together to very intentionally bring his son at just the right time to die on a cross for us is the same one who's working it all together now. The world may seem like it's in chaos. It is in God's control. Now, I might look at it and go, God, I wouldn't do it that way. And so might you. But all I can really do is turn off the news and pray and look at the Word. Because the answer is, He's doing it exactly the way He needs to make it happen. And someday when we enter into glory, we're all going to look and go, oh. Right? When He returns, that's what everybody's going to say. Oh. We're going to hear this collective, oh. Because all of a sudden, it's going to be clear, not just what in the world is God doing, but why it had to happen exactly the way it had to happen, which frankly, most of it makes no sense to me right now. But guys, this is also why casual Christianity will not work in this day and age. Guys, the, 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 the average church attender attends church 1.6 Sundays a month. Those are people who profess faith in Christ and say they belong to a church. They attend 1.6 Sundays a month. And I'm telling you, this isn't about attendance, but this is about we need each other. Guys, the world is screaming an anti-gospel message. We need to gather together as God's people as often as we can so that we can be strengthened to the gospel, so that we can go out and share the gospel with those nominal Christians, those people that might profess faith in Christ, but you see no evidence of, of it in their life, right? And the completely unchurched who have no idea about the good news of the gospel or the flood, the judgment that is coming. We need, to be able, we need to be together to strengthen each other. So what does it cost to make peace? First, we have to stay persistent. In a world where it's hard. Guys, it's hard to stay true to God's word. It's hard to stay true to the connectedness of the one another's. It is so easy to escape into self-medication. It is so easy to escape into, I just want what's comfortable. 
But that's not what he's called us to. He's called us not to comfort, but to glory. So the second point that we're going to see in Isaiah is we must change our perception. We must change our perception. Look at verse 3. It says, The steadfast of mind, he will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Guys, what do I mean by, by perception? I don't just mean, okay, so I, I need to, I, it's how I see everything as filtered through the Father. I don't just mean like how I see the world and, okay, this is what God's doing in my life. Yes, that. We, but we need to change our perception in, in how do we see not just what God is allowing into my life, but from where it is coming. Because if we got nothing else out of the last 24 weeks in Revelation and Daniel, this story is a story of kingdom. And it's a story of two kingdoms. God's controlled by Jesus Christ and the world's controlled by Satan. And we are in kingdom conflict. And we need to see, that's what I mean by perception. We need to see that kingdom conflict so that when the conflict comes and it does come in physical pain and emotional hurt and in relational strife we need to see it for what it is it is a battle for kingdom glory and who's going to get the glory in it the pharmaceutical company or god and again i'm not anti-drugs okay. who's going to get the glory in a reconciled relationship if there's no opportunity for that relationship to reconcile because the people just leave they just, they just divorce. God gets no glory for that. But look at verse 3. I, I, I love this. The steadfast of mind. Those who fix their mind on God is what that means. You will keep in perfect peace. In the Hebrew, which is what Isaiah was written in, that, that perfect peace is the word shalom. Shalom. Many of you know what that word means. Many of you don't. But shalom is the Hebrew word for peace, and it's used 237 times in the Old Testament. But you know how it's often used? It's used as a welcome. When Moses sees his father-in-law father Jethro, you know what they ask each other? I think it's in Genesis 18. How's your peace? How's your shalom? In our vernacular today, you know how I'd ask it, how I ask people? How's your soul? How's your soul? How are you? How's your mind, will, and emotions? Are you at peace? We ask it around here. What's become, well, I praise God, that what's become such a common part of our, of our language at Cornerstone in and out of the Sunday gathering is, how can I pray for you right now? That's another way of saying, how is your shalom? But guys, shalom peace is not an absence of conflict or tension. It's recognizing God is in the middle of that conflict or tension. That's how you find your shalom peace. It's not denying that the tension exists. It's not just hoping your marriage is going to get better, but I don't really want to be the one who brings up the problem. right? It's, it's not just failing to pursue reconciliation. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring peace by just moving away. That's not really bringing shalom peace because there's no presence of God in the midst of that. Shalom peace is God's presence in the midst of it. Guys, the absence of shalom peace, here's what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah was, was a later prophet of Isaiah. He says this, They have healed the wound of my people. They, meaning the prophets, have healed the wound of my people. This is God speaking, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. It's like us saying, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. When we all know there's a problem in the room. That is the opposite of shalom. That is the opposite of keep in perfect peace those who trust in him. Guys, conflict and tension, and again, I'm not talking about confrontation, like fighting. Once something has become a fight, an argument, like, like we see this argument, we argue. Carrie and I never argue. But the girls and I, we argue. The minute we enter into an argument, there is no longer any communication happening. There is only rebuttal being thought of. Right? So I'm not talking about arguing. I am talking about leading into the tension that is just in relationship. Why? Because we're all different. Kylie is wired differently than me. Emma is wired differently than me. So we're going to have, so is Abby. I better say that or they're going to say, wait a minute, why do you say Abby? And so is Abby. <laughs> but, but, so we're going to have tension in our relationship. 
Because things they like, I don't like. Things they do, I don't like. And vice versa. It's ha- but, but God's using that, right? To, to take the beauty of their Christ-likeness and press it into me so that I look more like Christ. And vice versa. But if all we do is surround ourselves with people who make us feel better, what we're really seeing is, I just want people that look like me. Well, guess what? At the end of glory, when you enter into glory, guess what you're going to look like? You. That's not, what, that's not the end game. What, remember, we talked about this several times the last few weeks of Revelation. The end game for, Christ, for a Christian. The win for Jesus Christ is that you enter into glory. He's already sealed the win of your salvation. The win when you enter into glory is Christ-likeness. He is in the business of making you look like Him. And sometimes that I'll just say it. Stinks. From my perspective, it doesn't always feel good. But it's how do we change our perception? Guys, if we are never rubbing people, the world, or each other the wrong way, we are either hanging out with the wrong people or we're saying the wrong things. If you walk around, you're like, if, I don't get what he's talking about. This is a message about peace, and my life is really peaceful, and I never have any tension or conflict in any of my relationships. You are either hanging out with all the wrong people, people that are all just like you, or you're just saying the wrong things. You're not talking about anything that really matters. Conflict and tension are different than confrontation, but they're necessary. Guys, the bottom line is we need to see our perception as not, we need to see our lives as not being comfortable, but being Christ-like. That's his end game for us. And look what happened to him. Guys, was, was, was his life, was Christ's life comfortable? No. He was persecuted, not just on the cross. His whole earthly existence he was persecuted. And he kept pressing on. So, the question was, what does it cost to make peace? We must stay persistent, we must change our perception, and we must trust in his protection. So we have to stay persistent, we have to believe that we're living for the kingdom. Kingdom glory, keep looking up. Keep looking up. That's that's what it's about. The the struggle of the here and now is about there and then. And we got to filter our lives through that. Right? We've got to change our perception. We've got to get that the conflict that is in front of us is not the person, it's a kingdom conflict. And when, there's, when there is tension in the house of God or in a marriage that is set on the gospel, it is kingdom conflict. Who's, when, when Carrie and I are in intense fellowship, since we don't fight, there is a battle for kingdomness right there. I want my kingdom she wants her kingdom. Neither of us in that moment are living for his kingdom. That's the truth. And that's true in every relationship we're in. And then the last thing is we must trust his protection. Look at verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord. Guys, if, if, if verses 3 and 4 are not underlined, highlighted, circled, and maybe written on a card and put on your dashboard of your car, you should do that today. It's okay to write in your Bible. It really is. Right? I think it was Spurgeon who said, a, lean, a clean Bible makes for a lean Christian. Right? It is okay. Now, when you start paying attention to the words you wrote in your Bible more than the words that are in your Bible, that's a problem. But it's okay to write in your Bible. And I would encourage you to underline verses 3 and 4. He keeps in perfect peace those who trust in Him. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Last week, Jeff taught on thank- Pastor Jeff taught on thankfulness. It was a great message. And he, ta- and he said, here's where our thankfulness flows from. We know that He is God, and we know that we are His. Because that's how we can be thankful. In the midst of struggles, in the midst of trials, in the midst of physical sick- sickness, whatever it is, I still know He's God, and I know He's His. Guys, Here's the thing. Everything in life, every, everybody listen to me. This, everything in life is filtered through these two questions. And I'm saying this as a believer who was a God-mocking atheist for half of my life. 
Everything, even as a God-mocking atheist, everything in my life was filtered through these two questions. Who is God? What do I think about God? When, when I think about God, what comes to mind? And then the second one is, what do I think about what he thinks of me? Everything in your life, moment by moment, believer or unbeliever, the whole world. Uh, they say, wait a minute, if you were a God-mocking atheist, what do you mean about what you think about God? That's what I thought about God. How did that not color everything in my life? Of course it did. My denial of his existence is what I thought about him. Why? Because I wanted to be my own God. That's why atheists are atheists. They won't ever say it. I wouldn't have said it. I was too humble. <laughs> yeah, those of you that laughed got it. I was too prideful to actually admit I want to be my own God. But that's why atheists are atheists. We cloud it in all the science that I, that I studied and taught and have a degree in, and we cloud it in all these other arguments that we make about the existence of God and other religions and how could a good God send people to hell. And all that. We cloud it in all these arguments that we want to get distracted by because we're hiding from the truth of who is God and who does he say you are. Well, God says I'm a good person, so I don't need Jesus. That's not God. That's your heart. That's you convincing yourself that you're just better than that guy. That's religion. Religion is scorekeeping, and as long as my score is better than most of the other people's score, I'm going to get in and they're not. What Jesus says is, no, it's about relationship. It's about who do you, who do you say I am? It's the question of life. He asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And then who do you say I say you are? And unless your answer is, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and He is a great Savior. Right? It's, it's Isaac, Isaac Newton, Amazing Grace song. John Newton, Isaac Newton. No, it wasn't Isaac Newton. John Newton. I, mean, I, knew it was, I knew it was a Newton. Fig Newton. It was John Newton, Amazing Grace. Remember this? It, when he says, I know, I know these two truths. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Right? That's what we have to know about what he says. So peacemaking flows from knowing whose you are, knowing what he's done, the cross, and knowing what he's doing in your life. That's how you can experience the perfect peace because you trust in him. Here's what's interesting. When he says, when I was studying this passage, it says, for in God we have an everlasting rock. And as Christians, we see this as the rock that is Jesus Christ. And it is, right? It's even on our, it's even on our um, logo for the church. Right, the cornerstone, the rock. But here's what's interesting. That word in Hebrew, rock there, is the word S-U-R, sir, in Hebrew. And it actually has a connotation of being like a money bag that has your valuables in it that has been tied to your hand to take with you on a journey. You're not getting it, and I, and I get it, because it took me a while to wrestle through that. It is the picture of God taking what is precious to him, putting it in his bag and tying it to his hand as he takes you on a journey. You have an everlasting rock because he is always with you because you're with him. That's what Isaiah is trying to remind us of here. He's saying you are, it's, it's the scene when David is going to go kill um, Abigail's husband who was, I'm blanking on the name now. Nabal, yeah, just a scoundrel of a dude. And King David's like, I'm going to go, I'm slaughtering this guy. He's an idiot. Sorry, we're not supposed to say that word. He's not a smart person, right? And, and his wife comes and, and, and stop. It was, it was Abigail, right? His wife comes. Sorry, they know more Bible than I do. His wife comes and says, and says, stop. I know my husband's not that bright. And then he reminds David of something. Even when you are pursued by the one who takes you, wants to, like your life, you are safe in God's treasure pouch. Guys, think about that for a second. That's your reality. That's the reality that we have in Christ. Even when you are pursued by the enemy Satan who wants to take you to hell with him, you are safe in God's treasure pouch. That is, yeah, that, that brings joy to my soul because I know I don't often feel safe. I'm not often at peace because I don't trust. Guys, that's, that's ultimately why I struggle with peace, because I have trust issues. 
Every time I'm in turmoil, every time I'm anxious, every time I turn that fear into anger, which is what men generally do, and, and women do too, but men in particular, we take the fear and the uncertainty and we turn it to anger. It's ultimately what I'm saying is, I don't trust God. He is, over and over in the last couple of months, he's been asking me, Doug, do you trust me? Doug, do you trust me? Because if you trust me, you'll be at peace. Why? Because you know that I got this. Whatever it is, I've got this. It might be your demise, but I've got this. Do you trust me? Peace costs something. And Jesus paid it. Guys, that's where the gospel comes in. Right? That's the only way we can live this way is, is when we live believing that, that to, to, to make peace, to be a peacemaker, it costs something. You know what it costs? It costs death. To be at peace with God, Romans, our invocation passage. He reconciled us to himself through peace with God in Christ Jesus. How? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The, our peace with God costs death. Our peace with each other, guess what it costs? Death. Death to self. I want, I want, I want, I want. No peace. What does he want? What do I give here? That's where you're going to find your peace. Guys, the only way that can happen is through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ by knowing that the plan, which is, which is just the gospel story from beginning to end, that the plan he started at creation, at the fall, he has put in, to, he, has, he has faithfully been bringing to this point that we celebrate at Christmas and he will bring it into completion at the restoration of all things. That's the only way we can really have peace is by trusting he's got this. He is in control. He's got it all figured out. And oh, by the way, he knows better than I do. He always has the long view. God always has the long view of your life. You know what my view is? Like, like what's, t well, let's see, it's, it's 5 to 10, or 5 to 11. So, you know, it's, yeah, that's, uh, or 1 to 11 according to that clock. So, uh, that, that's my view of life. How much longer do I have before I need to get off of here so we can get to baptisms? That's my view of life. Seriously. His view is like, no, this is so much bigger. I've, I've got the long view. And, and he just, and then the last thing I'll just say, guys, and I'm going to end with this as we, the music team comes up and we respond in song and in baptism and in prayer and, um, and we just spend the rest of our time together responding to the gospel. Guys, do you see... Jesus is better. Nothing I just said today means, uh, means anything unless you just believe that Jesus is better. Right? And, and I can't make you believe that about, about your salvation or about any part of your life. I can't. But He can. His Spirit can. So are you staying persistent in your pursuit of His will? Are you willing to change your perception of conflict? Are you trusting in his protection over your life? Because that is what it costs to be a peacemaker. We have to see him as better. We have to see him as more worthy. We have to see that I must decrease, that he might increase. But guys, get this. When we are peacemakers, listen to this. This is Jesus talking Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And guys, that word sons there isn't just one of the places where maybe the Bible didn't get, like that he really meant sons and daughters. No, that's not what he meant there. There are places where that's true, where it is okay to change the word son to child of God, because he meant men and women. Here's what he means. In their culture at that time, the son did the family's business. And everybody that was listening to him on the Sermon on the Mount when he says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. He wasn't getting into gender. He was saying, you will be about my father's business. That's what he's called us to be. He's called us to take the peace of God to a world that has no peace. Let's pray. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for what it took 
And, and the crazy thing is, is that you knew what it was going to take. You knew, but you knew before you created that the cross was going to come. You did. Because you, you're outside of time. The moment you spoke creation into existence is the same day that Christ died on the cross and it's the same day that he's going to come again to you because it's all one thing. And yet, you entered into our junk. You came here to live among us that we might experience your peace. And then you showed us what it takes, what it took. You were pierced for our transgressions. You were crushed for our iniquities. These don't sound like peaceful terms to me. The weight of our sin, my sin, the world's sin were placed upon you. And, and in that moment, your father turned his face away and for the one time in your eternal existence, you were separated. That's what you were afraid of. And that's what you had to trust in God for. And so Lord, I want to pray right now for those of us that feel separated from you. We feel like you're distant. Lord, you pursued Adam and Eve in the garden. You pursued Abraham. You pursued David. You pursued your disciples. You're still pursuing people today. You're a God that doesn't turn from us when we push you away, you just keep pressing into us. Why? Because you're a peacemaking God. So Lord, may we stop filling that pain and conflict that we feel with things that we're trying to mask. And may we just come to you and there find our peace. Lord, I thank you that though peace cost you the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, you paid it in Jesus' name. Amen.